and where you are. My name is Steve Sand. I am the director of the SOAS China Institute, and I am your host this afternoon. And welcome back to, the, to those of you who were with us in the morning sessions, and welcome to those of you who are joining us only for these afternoon sessions. Um, since it is the second session of today's proceedings, I am not going to repeat the introductions and opening remarks that were made at the beginning of um, this conference in the morning. But I would like to um, re remind everybody that we are following the uh, picture kucha format, which means that it will be uh, 20 slides for 20 seconds each, making a total of six minutes, 40 seconds for each presentation, which is extremely demanding on our speakers. Um, very pleased to report that even though this is an experimental format we are using today, the morning session went very well with the format. Uh, speakers were all uh, responding very well to that time frame. As I advise all the speakers uh, when they start their presentations either with the slides up or when they are speaking, if they are not using slides, I will turn the uh, stopwatch on my phone on. And then at the end of that six minutes, 40 seconds, uh, you will hear a single doorbell, which is a um, reminder to speakers that their time is up. But then um, there is, this being experimental for every one of us, if you need to have an extra 30 seconds or even a minute or so, uh, feel free to do so, but please try not to exceed that. And at some point, about seven, a minute or so after the uh, allotted time, I will come in and advise the speakers to wind up. We have an extremely a wide range of speakers range up today to talk about a whole lot of very important subjects related to China. Um, as I uh, explained this morning, this conference, even though it's being hosted by the China Institute at SOAS, really is a SOAS-wide operation, and we are much more focused on getting how different regions and countries that are being studied at SOAS respond to the and perceive the rise of China rather than dealing with how China approached the subject itself. Um, the one change to the program is that the, our final speaker for today, uh, Hazel Smith, a colleague from SOAS, regrettably has to pull out because she is traveling in Washington DC and in spite of it being the capital city of the United States of America, she is finding it difficult to be able to have a reliable internet connection where she is. A bit of a surprise, but it's a kind of interesting tidbit. And I thought you should know why she is not being able to join after all. Now, with that, let us start the um, presentations for this afternoon session. Our first session will have two speakers. Um, we will have Hassan Karat from the Lahore University of Management Sciences and also uh, Tild Mostolansky from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva speaking on the in important subject of the Bell and Road as political technology, power and economy in Pakistan and Tajikistan. With that, I hand over to you, Hassan and, and Tilda. That is really uh, fascinating and welcomed Galant. I see that you have uh, managed to join in spite of having some earlier IT issues of joining us. Excellent. Um, 
with, with you firmly in place, let me just hand over to you, uh, Professor Galant Merchant from the James Madison University to speak on the monometric presence of China in Nepal. Um, your six minutes, 40 seconds starts when you start talking. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tsang. And I apologize for my late arrival just in the nick of time here. I had technical difficulties, which I would think so many months into our COVID pandemic, we would be able to resolve. I'm happy to join and speak here on uh, the volumetric presence of China in Nepal. This presentation analyzes the volumetric growth of China's presence in Nepal from 2014 to 2021 in material, territorial, and discursive terms, from physical experiences with earthquake disaster to the symbolic and political power of Chinese infrastructure development, BRI and otherwise, the paper offers presence as a volumist, volumetric heuristic to examine how China has become particularly prominent in Nepal in recent years. The analysis is framed by three key periods, material interactions in 2014 and 2015, territorial transformations in 2016, 2019, and new discursive depths reached in 2020 and 2021. I like to use territory as a bundle of political techniques employed to measure land and control terrain. This engages the new volumetric turn in the social sciences. In adding to that term, I want to add presence. So material interactions reached a new uh, level of, uh, well, new volumes between Nepal and China in 2014 and 2015. This includes uh, the first time Chinese FDI exceeded Indian FDI in Nepal in 2014, followed by the earthquakes in 2014, I'm sorry, in 2015 in Nepal. This opened up tremendous new uh, humanitarian space for China to act as a new humanitarian and global actor. This then was followed in 2016 and, and ongoing still today with new uh, relationships of diplomacy, connectivity, and security. This includes joint statements and transit treaties between Beijing and Kathmandu, articulated around the One China policy and new extradition agreements, as well as new aid and loan packages and railroad and energy uh, infrastructures. I'm sorry, my slides were moving ahead of me there. I'm trying to reset them here. In, in 2016, a new Nepal-China joint statement was articulated, which for the first time drew and codified direct connections between international investment and infrastructure development with mutual agreements to border security and, and territorial, the exercise of territorial power over Nepali subjects, particularly Tibetan populations. The, the red highlights here identify a number of these key aspects. In 2019, this was more formally linked with Nepal's BRI Belt and Road projects, of which there are nine key projects comprising road development, energy transmission development, and uh, education and outreach programs in addition to a train project. Now, these infrastructure projects largely revolve around what's envisioned as a new multidimensional connectivity network between Nepal and China, which Nepal's President Bandari articulated at the second Belt and Road Forum. Soon after the Belt and Road Forum, Chinese Premier Xi Jinping made a high profile visit to Kathmandu at which a number of other MOUs were, were articulated and signed in Kathmandu. This was the first visit of a, a Chinese president to Nepal 
in recent decades. And it, it led to a tremendous growth of attention around and, and energy embracing China's new role as a development actor in Nepal. I, what I would like to do now is examine some of the discursive power of this event. And, and the discursive depths which have been reached in Nepal as, a, as really a, a dialectical uh, synthesis of material and territorial activities. So the BRI is widely articulated in Nepal as, I'm sorry, um, as development that it can be done differently after Nepal has experienced decades of unfulfilled development promises. However, while the BRI has a conspicuous presence in Nepal, BRI projects across the Himalaya are often absent from Belt and Road maps. And this is a, a key paradox that I'd like to explore here. Some of the largest and most high profile Chinese development projects in Nepal in recent years have actually nothing to do with the Belt and Road. These include post earthquake disaster reconstruction projects, the development of large new inland dry ports and the, the rehabilitation of the major bridge, the Friendship Bridge connecting uh, Nepal and China along the Friendship Highway. Beijing and the Chinese embassy in Nepal have also undertaken massive uh, earthquake projects in urban context, the, the redevelopment and restoration of the Hanuman Doka Palace, the, the historical Durbar High School, and the expansion of a Chinese um, business enclave in Kathmandu known as the New Chinatown. None of these projects are Belt and Road. However, they're often associated with Belt and Road in popular Nepali discourse. What are Belt and Road projects in Nepal are rarely depicted in popular maps and are not, are actually uh, suspended right now and are not moving forward. So on the one hand, we have the suspension of BRI projects, but the progress of China aid projects. What is, what, why does this matter? What does this paradox mean? Although many BRI projects appear dead on the ground in a material sense, a closer examination shows that BRI agreements help accomplish other territorial work often advanced through discursive means. So even if the territorial outcomes may be more successful than many material initiatives, it's attention to the latter that, that we need to attend to. What has happened is a, a handshake across the Himalayas has evolved into a new form of Chinese um, extraterritorial power and surveillance in Nepal. The support of, of Nepal's own government surveillance over Tibetan populations. And why does this matter? Although Nepal is just one relatively small state neighboring China, the material, territorial, and discursive process at work here resonate with similar dynamics of Chinese investment and development across the world. I believe I've reached the end of my time here. I'm sorry that I was um, not better organized and, and able to, to keep to the time, but I appreciate all of the behind the scenes work from, from colleagues there at SOAS, and I look forward to, to joining the conversation in the forthcoming presentations. Fantastic, um, Galan, thank you very much for that. It's a very thoughtful presentation, which I'm sure we will be uh, reflecting on much. Our next speaker is Dipao from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace on Southern Asia relationship with China. And he will spell on more specifically how he will focus the presentation. Over to you, Dip. Thank you. I'm just going to try and share my screen in a second. Okay, is this visible? Excellent, it's on. Okay, wonderful. All right, um, so uh, thank you. And I'm, I'm unlike others, I'm going to try and uh, take on a very ambitious project of uh, talking about four countries in six uh, minutes and 40 seconds, which uh, uh, is not something I've ever done. So, so hopefully we'll manage to get to the end. Um, essentially, this is a project that we uh, have been working on in Carnegie over the last year, and uh, 
trying to understand the effect of uh, Chinese engagement, which we have seen increase in various parts of the world. And uh, what I'm going to talk about are four South Asian countries, uh, namely Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, Maldives, and uh, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, and, and how the engagement has changed uh, in the last decade and what it has meant for these countries. So when we started the project, we found that uh, there was a lot of talk about what China was doing. And what you see in front on, on your screens are basically uh, newspaper uh, headlines from across the region, which talks about uh, projects, which talks about meetings. But what we did have trouble figuring out is how is this uh, kind of affecting the countries. So right at the beginning, we uh, looked into basically three kinds of dimensions or variables, if you please. Uh, and we got to those by looking at the kind of questions that were at the center of, of this project, essentially trying to understand if there were any kind of vulnerabilities that were present in these countries and uh, how, was, uh, how was Chinese engagement interacting with these vulnerabilities. We uh, divided Chinese engagement and the impact of Chinese engagement along uh, three uh, specific kind of dimensions. Uh, uh, the, the effect on uh, institutions, on the robustness of institutions, on uh, civil society, as well as on the dynamics of prospective elite, elite capture by either Chinese actors or by their proxies. And these are the indicators and sub-indicators that we kind of broke these three uh, dimensions into, which uh, brought us to a set of findings which we found to be common across the region. And I'm not going to speak about each one of them here, but essentially, a uh, couple of things, one being that we, when we talk about Chinese engagement with countries, we kind of think only about uh, Chinese push. Uh, what uh, we found is that there is a great deal of uh, pull as well uh, in terms of um, these countries when having the option of, of partnering with various countries, they essentially look at uh, partners that can fulfill the kind of requirements, national requirements or national objectives that they have. And in South Asia, very often that is, uh, those are infrastructure projects. And China has successfully presented itself as a dependable and consistent partner as far as they are concerned. At the same time, uh, we also found that uh, uh, these countries do not necessarily borrow always from China. We found, for example, that Bangladesh prefers soft loans over commercial loans, and Nepal, in fact, prefers grants over any other kind of loans. And that reflects in the, in the balance sheet in the kind of uh, grants or loans that these countries ha have taken. Uh, which brings us to how we saw the kind of risks in, in uh, these three countries. What is significant here, uh, significant to understand here is that, uh, as you will see, uh, the countries are at various places in the kind of vulnerabilities uh, that they display. And it's a sliding scale, which basically means that these countries may uh, slide from being high risk to medium risk and back. And elections we found are key in this. So, for example, if you look at uh, vulnerability three, which is uh, on um, uh, how, how influenceable elites are, uh, you will find Maldives being medium risk under the current Soli administration. And it has moved here from uh, being high risk under the previous uh, Yamin administration. And what is important to remember here is that all of these countries are going um, into elections in the next uh, two or three years. So that is a space that will require to be watched. Uh, digging down a little deeper into these particular vulnerabilities, um, Institutionally, Nepal continues to be democratizing, and that creates a pressure on institutions, which affects the efficacy of the bureaucracy or even of law um, enforcement agencies. Uh, whereas, while in Bangladesh, uh, the institutions exist, but uh, there is pressure on them from cases of domestic corruption. In fact, we heard that a number of projects uh, that were being signed up in Bangladesh, which has among the largest number of projects you will find um, that are being assisted uh, by China, um, being even um, the projects that have been greenlit, uh, not even being viable. So that's that's a major concern. Whereas in uh, Sri Lanka, where the institutions are the strongest, the issue of elite capture really comes in and creates uh, uh, it is, is uh, has potential to disturb the stability of the institutions. The media also uh, works differently in, in all of these countries. Um, in Nepal, for example, since the 2000 in Beijing Olympics, there has been less and less space on the local media to uh, cover issues such as uh, that of Tibetan refugees. Uh, the the uh, civil society organizations have less and less uh, space to bring up issues of, of uh, Tibetan refugees. Whereas uh, in Bangladesh, you see a lot of self-censorship. The uh, ownership of media is opaque, which kind of leads to uh, these countries, uh, these, these institutions uh, self-censoring them when it comes to talking about uh, China. In um, 
As far as uh, the risk to elites is concerned, this is highest in Sri Lanka, where we have seen Rajapaksa's work with China very, very closely. It's the lowest in Bangladesh, where uh, there is a strong political party in power. However, again, elections are important because if there is a question of legitimacy, uh, the party will turn towards the neighbors such as China and India, and what kind of influence China can play on elites will become important there. Talking a little bit about uh, where the relationships uh, have changed in this, uh, in this while, uh, in uh, Bangladesh, uh, the economic aspect of the relationship has come up very, very fast. Uh, since last year, 97% of Bangladesh's exports uh, to China are tariff-free. However, something interesting is uh, we heard people talk about how they did not have enough things to even uh, sell China. However, as Bangladesh uh, climbs out of being an LDC country, uh, China and Bangladesh are discussing a bilateral trade agreement, which Bangladesh says is going to be crucial moving forward. In Maldives, this is a relationship that has been very regime dependent. It is a new relationship. And Maldives uh, among, have, seems to have the lowest capacity, state capacity among the four, four countries, which leads to uh, concerning financial instruments such as sovereign backed loans, where private individuals are given loans, which uh, essentially are backed by the Maldives government. And in fact, uh, uh, earlier this year, there was a possibility that um, uh, an, an individual who had taken a loan during the earlier administration was about to default, and the Maldives government would have had to bail uh, him out, which uh, luckily did not happen. In Nepal, uh, the question of democratization and the lack of capacity of institutions con uh, continues to be the most worrisome. Uh, the other aspect that we have seen is uh, a connection between political parties in Nepal and China, especially uh, under the previous uh, communist government, where not only were workshops being held between the uh, CPC and the, uh, and the government in uh, Nepal, we also saw questions of COVID aid being distributed through political parties as given by China uh, coming up. And in Sri Lanka, uh, the issue is of elite capture, but a, a equal issue is uh, equally uh, concerning issue is that of uh, the economic uh, a situation in the country. And uh, as of now, China seems to be the only player who's in a position who's willing to, in any form, bail out uh, Sri Lanka. As long as that problem is not taken care of, this will continue to be an issue. So where do we go from here? Uh, some lessons and recommendations. Now, um, we found China essentially coming to these countries and asking them what they can do for these countries. And that is something that other players might want to do if they want to be more relevant. The other aspect being uh, China, again, uh, looking at uh, the national interests or nat national priorities of these countries, which happens to be infrastructure. Other players, if they want to be relevant, might also want to do the same. Uh, the uh, question of debt trap keeps coming up, but we found that uh, if you, when you look at the kind of uh, loans and grants that these countries have taken, Sri Lanka seems to be on the precipice, but the others, not so much. And finally, um, uh, uh, there are vulnerabilities in these countries which are being exacerbated in the way uh, Chinese engagement has worked out. Capacity building by other actors in case they want to come in and, and, and play a role in these countries is possibly the way for, forward. I rushed through a lot. There's a lot more detail in case you want uh, to look more uh, in, into it more. Uh, we have the report up in the Carnegie Endowment website. It's also in local languages. Uh, so uh, in case that's, yeah. that's something that you please, want to look please, at. Please wire. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to stop there and look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much indeed. I think that's really interesting and helpful. Um, our next speaker um, is Alice Pangshu Lin from the Harvard Academy for International and Area Studies. And she'll be speaking on the subject of being and belonging among Pakistan's China of Chinese diaspora. Over to you, Alice. Thank you. Um, could you let me know if you see my full screen? If yes, I your PPT is up. Okay, is it in full screen? Yeah. Well, yes, I think. Uh, I mean, well, I, I'm seeing your next slide as well. On my, oh, okay. on my screen. Sorry, let me just let me just redo this. Sorry, my one, one second. Um, yes, now full screen. Sorry. Disappeared. Oh, excuse me. Um, don't me just, don't worry. Don't worry. Let me just try this again. 
Okay. Do you see this? Full screen. Okay, perfect. Okay. So um, I will be offering a broad overview of a heterogeneous community with rich and diverse personal histories that intersect with the making of contemporary South Asia. Uh, my presentation will also take us away from the centrality of the Belt and Road project that is at the heart of Chinese presence in Pakistan today. So let me begin by plotting the trajectories of one interlocutor, whom I'll call Sam, and whose personal history and a trajectory is shaped by the political history of South Asia. Born in a family of seven in the mid-1950s in Chittagong, Sam was the son of a tannery and restaurant owner located in Dhaka. Uh, while Sam self-identifies as Pakistani Chinese, his parents are by nationality Indian. His parents moved from Kol Kolkata, home to one of the largest Chinese communities in the subcontinent, to Chittagong in the 1940s, um, and during the nine month long civil war in 1971 that led to the formation of a new country, Bangladesh, the whole family fled by boarding a cargo ship from Karachi. And from Karachi, Sam eventually moved to Lahore where he set up his own restaurant. So I use my, personal, uh, my interlocutor's personal history to show the rich experiences of a community endogamous to Pakistan, yet whose histories complicate our understanding of Chinese presence in Pakistan. In what follows, I will briefly highlight the origins of this community connected by their hyphenated belongings, um, followed by the occupational fields for which they are known and ending with some insight into their cultural practices that are syncretic and unique. So some of the earliest Chinese uh, in South Asia immigrated to Kolkata during the British era as early as the 18th century. Many of my interlocutors speak of their parents or grandparents as originating from the Chinese provinces of Guangdong Hubei and Shandong, who then found themselves dispersed in different places with each monumental historical shift. Uh, the partitioning of India and Pakistan in 1947, the India-China War in 1962, and later the independence of Bangladesh in 1971. Today, these connected communities reside in large cities like Karachi, Lahore, and Rawalpindi. But in the city of Karachi in particular, the local Chinese are often associated with one, a distinct profession as the China Dandan Saz. Taking up the economic niche of dentistry, a small community of primarily Hubeinis set up multiple dental clinics in the Sada district of Karachi. Um, the majority of uh, the Pakistani Chinese are Hakka speaking. Uh, among the women I interviewed, many took up the profession of a beautician or owner of a beauty parlor, offering a range of services typical to local salons such as threading or bridal uh, mehendi makeup. One of the most um, well-known and prestigious beauticians among my interlocutors is a woman named Daniela, hailing from also a Hakka family. Her beauty parlor is located in Islamabad and has seen the patronage of multiple famous politicians such as Hillary Clinton, Margaret Thatcher, and Benazir Bhutto. Uh, in Ravopindi, the evergreen Wansing Boot House is a reminder of the Hakka Kabla families who have successfully established their business in another niche economy. Others of a similar nature can be found in Lahore, um, the family that runs a shop in Pindi in Rawalpindi kindly shared the photograph of what the entrance of their shop looked like in the 1970s. Um, the next two slides will likely leave the audience hungry. Um, a localized um, variant of Chinese food began to take over the culinary scene in major cities of Pakistan in the 1970s. Um, soups thickened with corn flour and chicken chow mein in the picture on the right became known as Chinese dishes and were popularized by Hakka restaurant owners like Sam's father. Um, some of the first Chinese restaurants in Pakistan were opened in Karachi. Um, the ABC restaurant, for instance, opened in the southern area of Karachi as early as the 1930s. Uh, many others have opened in Karachi, Islamabad, and Lahore since then. Um, and these restaurants serve a hybrid Chinese cuisine tailored to the tastes of locals, which some have referred to as desi chini kana, which means local Chinese food. I have spoken about some of the economic niches in which um, the Pakistani Chinese have established themselves. Now I want to turn to some of the cultural practices that express most visibly their identity and belonging. I want to return to my interlocutor Sam here, who despite all of his time spent in the subcontinent maintain a strong connection with the birthplace of his parents. I quote him here. I went back to Maysia and for the first time in 1980, I was 24. My parents and I were the first ones to go to celebrate my grandmother's 80th birthday. It took us 14 hours to reach Hong Kong from Pakistan. Since the 1980s, he has returned to Maysian at least 18 times. These visits had a dual effect. He reconnected with distant relatives, but who he otherwise would not interact with, 
but he also experienced disconnections in witnessing a mode of life and culture that was distant uh, to him as a Pakistani Chinese. Now, moving on to the private spheres of my interlocutors' lives, um, the homes of my interlocutors are spaces through which they can establish a sense of uh, belonging and identity. A few of the photos here demonstrate the importance of domestic material culture in creating connections with Chinese culture. Um, while my uh, interlocutors are an ethnic minority, they have also chosen to belong to a religious minority. Uh, many of the Pakistani Chinese converted to Christianity uh, over the course of their stay in Pakistan. These conversions often took place after attending missionary schools. The reinvention of the self as Christian reveals larger social political processes at play. For example, the influence of missionary schools in Pakistan, as well as the salience of religious status. Many of my interlocutors frequent their, own, their local churches, and the church as a space creates connections between different communities and allows different minority groups to bond over their faith. Of major importance to the members of the Pakistani Chinese community is the maintaining of certain Chinese practices, often in a syncretic manner with Christianity. So many continue to observe a number of popular religious practices related to funeral ceremonies, ancestral rites, and Chinese festivals. Um, much like their counterparts in other parts of the world. Now, Christian rites are generally observed at funerals. Um, the preparation of a, a funeral celebration is performed by the priest, and then the deceased have a place in the cemetery reserved for Christians, as is an example of the Gora Kabristan, which literally means the cemetery for whites in, in Ravopindi. Um, ancestor worship is prevalent among the community. Within every home, there is an altar with a photo of deceased members of the family. And this practice is not without its indigenization. Around the photo of the deceased, one can often find draped a pulong kahar, um, a garland of flowers, which is um, typical of the a decorative art typical of the region. So in the last few years, some of my wealthier interlocutors have decided to leave Pakistan and move to North America. Those that have stayed behind are now increasingly subsumed within the CPEC induced rise of Chinese expats, migrants, and laborers. And yet their experiences and life stories reveal a longer and much more diverse connected history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice, for this really very, very interesting uh, presentation on the um, personal side of, this, of, of, of the links. Uh, our next speaker comes from the New York University in Shanghai. Um, Professor Maria Adele Karaid, speaking on the subject of questioning the debt trapped diplomacy rhetoric, focusing on the Habanj Tota port, which therefore picks up really well from some of the earlier presentations. Over to you, uh, Maria. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm very excited. I used to be at SOAS uh, during my Erasmus, so like a lot of good memories comes to mind. So um, let me just go straight to the presentation. China emergence as a great power in the past few decades has been accompanied by a change in rhetoric about the Asian giant. Especially now that it is expanding its reach with the Belt and Road Initiative, China is increasingly perceived as a threat to Western hegemony and to the international liberal order. Uh, part, uh, oh, okay. part of this rhetoric includes China debt trap diplomacy. The idea is that China is strategically trapping recipient country with loans that they can't repay. Uh, this is said to increase Chinese leverage and when recipient default, China can size strategic assets. Today I'm going to discuss a key example that has been used in support of the narrative of Chinese debt trap to show some of the myth of this narrative in the specific case of Hambantota port. The case of the 99 year lease of Hambantota port to China has become the example for excellence of Chinese debt trap diplomacy. It has also become a cautionary tale for countries that have joined or are considering joining the Belt and Road Initiative about potential side effects of receiving Chinese money. Uh, it is a story of a port that has been developed by Chinese state-owned enterprises from 2017 and depicted as a sex story uh, of the BRI in Chinese media. 
Uh, as we see in this article in the New York Times of 2018, the initial concessional agreement for Hambantota has been depicted by media as part of a Chinese attempt to burden countries under heavy debt and size them of their strategic assets. Unable to, to repay its debts, Sri Lanka gave uh, China a controlling equity stake at, and the 99-year lease of Hambantota port, uh, which it handed over in December 2017. This is according to the narratives. <clears throat> the, BRI, the BRI, according to this narrative, comprises part of a grand scheme that creates new dependencies by leveraging Chinese economic gains and bending recipient countries' sovereign and uh, will. The development of the Hambantota port, strategically located in the Indian Ocean uh, and an essential part of the maritime Silk Road, can be seen as part of the string of pearls, uh, China's geopolitical strategy to develop port projects in Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, and Maldives and Myanmar to encircle India and secure essential trade routes and energy supply that do not depend solely on the Malacca uh, Strait, as you can see here uh, in this map. Uh, while China's influence over Sri Lanka has increased in the past decades, I've identified in particular three reasons why the narrative of debt trade diplomacy is inappropriate, at least in this case. First, Sri Lanka's own government actively solicited the project. Two, the concessional agreement was not a debt equity swap arrangement. And third, the percentage of Sri Lanka debt owed to China remains a mere fraction to its overall sovereign debt. Um, so let's go to the first reason. So it was not China, but the Sri Lankan government itself uh, that saw out the loan for the court. Prime Minister Rajapaksa uh, and other officials after him declared that the, uh, the development of Hambantota was not uh, a Chinese proposal, but rather a request from the Sri Lanka uh, government. And Sri Lanka had initially approached the United States and India, who both refused. Uh, citing economic viability concern confirmed by feasibility uh, studies. So that they already asked, but they, 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 they didn't uh, get approved. Uh, and also the development of the port comprised part of uh, uh, Rajapaksa Mahinda uh, Chintana. Uh, so the vision for the future um, launched in 2010 during his sixth presidential election campaign. In this sense, it is hard to justify the idea that China actively plotted to put Sri Lanka into a debt trap. If this were the case, uh, there would be more example of debt trap diplomacy, uh, but research has shown that in case of debt insolvency or repayment difficulties, China has largely uh, renegotiated its uh, uh, deals. Let's move to the actual agreement. So um, also that, all, that started all this debt trap uh, uh, diplomacy narrative. The 99-year concessional agreement was signed in 2017 between Sri Lanka Ministry of Port and Shipping uh, and Sri Lanka Port Authority uh, and China Merchant Port, which is a China state-owned enterprise. Uh, the agreement set up two separate joint venture companies that oversee the port commercial and security operation uh, that are uh, auxiliary de facto of uh, China Merchant Port of China uh, state-owned enterprises. And the Sri Lanka Port Authority has just little share of these companies. Um, and according to the agreement, uh, China Merchant Port leased the Ambantota Port for 99 years and invested up to 1.12 billion in the port, uh, as well as other mar marine related activities in connection to the port, for a total area of 15,000 acres of land. The agreement has not been made available uh, in, uh, in public, uh, but there were ex excerpts uh, that were available online. Uh, is it a debt trap? So uh, the China debt trap narrative of Ambantota was primarily premised upon the idea that concessional agreement was a debt equity arrangement, uh, wherein a company's debt are exchanged for stock or equity. In 2019, however, officials uh, from Sri Lanka declared that the loan agreement for the port owed by the Sri Lanka government to China were separate from the concessional agreement of the port. The agreement was not a debt equity swap arrangement as many media described, uh, where Sri Lanka leads the territory for 99 years to China as a way to pay off the, back, the, 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 the debt. They were separate things. And what about Sri Lanka sovereignty that everybody was concerned? Um, so it is also important uh, uh, to note uh, that the rights of China merchant ports has acquired through the, this concessional agreement do not conclusively give its dominant authority over the port uh, because the territory remains under Sri Lanka sovereignty. 
The rights tied to the lease objective includes the exclusive right to develop, operate, manage Hamban Tota port, and more specifically, collecting revenues for all ports and maritime related uh, operation. Uh, so the sovereignty of Sri Lanka in theory is uh, uh, supported. What about weaponization, right? What if China used this, uh, this port uh, to, for, for military purposes? So although the rights over the port are divided between China merchant ports and the Sri Lankan government, um, some have seen Chinese commercial development of an increasing number of ports around the world, as you can see in this image, as a process of weaponization of the Belt and Road Initiative. The ports, especially in light of dual use technology, could provide logistical support to Chinese military operation as strategic strong points. And this is definitely a valid concern, uh, but in the case of Sri Lanka, the government has provided reassurance that the final lease agreement forbids military activity without its invitation, uh, its invitation and that Ambantota port is under Sri Lanka sovereignty. Sri Lanka government, moreover, um, moved its Southern Naval Command to, to the Hambantota port to further strengthening its and, and claiming its sovereignty also from a military perspective. That is uh, an issue. So although the agreement didn't include a debt equity swap and the Sri Lanka government achieved its goal, there are still issues of China predatory behavior, debt sustainability and economic viability and returns on the Hambantota port project. Many countries, as we can see here, are indebted to China. However, Sri Lanka debt vulnerability preceded and was unconnected to Chinese lending, casting doubt on the idea that China purposefully created Sri Lanka debt problem. The problem is the consequence of excessive borrowing from Western dominated capital market and Sri Lanka structural economic problems. In 2017, Sri Lanka outstanding uh, Chinese loans accounted for only 10%. And today, this continues to be the case. In 2019, Sri Lanka's external debt represented 42% of its uh, GDP, but only around 10% was on uh, to China. Uh, please, why not? Yeah. Uh, so the reasons for, for this debt is like economic non-viable plan for development, but also uh, some of the white elephant projects that were uh, produced uh, by China. Uh, and so there have been positive effects of Ambantota port. Uh, and so uh, Amadopo had become an energy hub and won uh, also some award, uh, increased the number of transshipment and provided opportunities for, uh, for, for the people, local people of Ambantota. Uh, although the number are still far from uh, the um, uh, Sri Lanka Port Authority aspiration of 2016. And so overall, I don't think that this uh, was this particular case is a good example of debt trap because it's not in the interest of China uh, uh, forcing countries into debt trap. Uh, China is also in a learning curve. So I think when it started, it, it didn't know very well a lot of things, but now it, it's a kind of improving. Uh, and of course, there has to be a ca caution more uh, from, from the host country. And so to conclude, the rhetoric of the debt trap diplomacy diplomacy diverts attention from other questions such as how China is actually transforming its rising power into influence and whether Chinese investments along the BRI actually improve a host country economy and the lives of its people. The complex nature and comprehensive scope of the BRI and China influence and reach should not be reduced to one single element, be it economic, military, cultural, or geopolitical. Chinese influence in Sri Lanka uh, and in other countries should be examined and analyzed through a broader prism uh, one that accounts for the recipient country or agency in shaping China's influence, the actual effects on the lives of their people. Thank you so much. Sorry for going overboard in this. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Maria. Just a very interesting and important presentation that you have made. Um, well worth the time being spent on it. Um, it's just the format which provides a bit of constraint to how we have to operate. Let's now move on to our first poll after five excellent presentations on these various elements of South Asia's responses to China. Uh, we have about five minutes to do the uh, polling. The speakers are not able to vote. Uh, participants are able to vote. So I'm encouraging you all to take part in the um, polling and we will watch it with great interest. I have, in the meantime, noticed that um, 
questions has been posed. Uh, the first question has been posed is to Alice. Now, we don't have, with the picture culture format that we are using, we don't actually have uh, scope for online discussions on this face-to-face, -face, uh, on, the, on the screen. But I would certainly encourage uh, speakers to whom questions or comments have been made and if they would like to respond to them and use the Q&A box to respond to those questions being raised. So there will still be uh, scope for discussions. And I noticed that Alice is responding to uh, Aram's questions in the Q&A box. In the meantime, please do, particularly if you are not a speaker, participate in the voting. I've noticed a second question being posed on the Q&A box. I think if you address the questions to a specific speaker, you are more likely to get a response than a general questions that any of the speakers can potentially respond. You may not necessarily get a bite to that. So if you would like to ask a specific question, please try to direct that to a specific speaker if possible. In the meantime, I noticed that the polling is now reaching 67% of participation. Okay, we're now getting 73%. Once the percentage is stabilized, then I will close the poll. Um, so if anyone would like to put one's votes to effect, now is the moment to do this. It looks like that we are stable, stabilizing at about 73% of participation rate. So let's see where we are. Um, where we are is that the first question is really about uh, the Chinese hard power and the second one about soft power. For the hard power questions, we have 5% who see China as being very positive in using its power, 37% on balance positive, 20% on balanced uh, negative, 7% very negative and 32% too complex to categorize. For the soft power question, 3% very positive, 25% on balance positive, 25% on balance negative, and 22% very negative, and 25% too complicated to be categorized. It's interesting that in fact, on the basis of the five presentations that uh, opinions are more positive about the actual use of Chinese hard power than the soft power that is coming out from 
China's involvement in South Asia, which is actually slightly different from the kind of polls we had this morning. And when we end this session, we will bring all the polling results together to give us an overall view. With that, let's move on to the next part of this session, which is more uh, about the Middle East involving also, also a bit of Central Asia in terms of its geographical focus. And the first speaker for this next part is uh, Jonathan Fulton from Abu Dhabi, the Sayef University. He will be speaking on Chinese on China's soft power outreach into the Middle East. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you. So this is going to be a double high wire act for me because it's it's research that I've uh, I'm, I, it's a first cut at this topic that I've never actually looked at very deeply before, and I'm also um, Jonathan. You are slightly faint in terms of the volume. Are you able to? Sure. Is that better? That is better. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. New mic. Um, so as I was saying, this is a, a first cut at a, a topic I've never actually tried to do any deep research on before, and I'm not using slides, so it's a real uh, high wire act for me trying to uh, manage the six, hour, six minutes and uh, 40 seconds. So the topic is China's soft power projection in the Middle East. Um, and this is something that I haven't done a whole lot of work on just because I've always been a little skeptical of soft power as a political scientist, because it's really kind of a fuzzy concept that tends to be often whatever people want it to be. And it's kind of hard analytically to measure it effectively or to, to, to define it very well. Um, but I have a book coming out in a couple of weeks. It's the Routledge Handbook on China Middle East Relations. And one of my colleagues uh, wrote a chapter uh, collecting data on the, the tools of soft power projection China's using in the Middle East. I thought it was pretty interesting. So I started thinking more about this and, and he and I are, are working on a, a paper and trying to think about this a little more critically. It's interesting because you can see a lot of people just assume, uh, you look at China's presence in the Middle East and it, it's just kind of a, a taken for granted that China's become a major power in the region. And economically, that's certainly the case. Politically, it's becoming the case. Um, but I think it's still a very um, misunderstood country in the region. Uh, there was a survey data from the Arab Barometer that was released this past January, and it showed that China was viewed more favorably than the U.S. in each of the six countries polled, and China was seen as, uh, its economic model was seen as less threatening to the six countries' uh, national interests than the U.S. is. But still, China's soft power is quite limited. And my experience teaching uh, Emirati students um, at, a, at a local university, students have very positive and very superlative views of China, but they have almost no knowledge about it. Um, it's interesting, we have a Confucius Institute, which very few students attend. Most, uh, most of the students who attend the Confucius Institute are, are a community outreach, uh, mostly the business community. Uh, my students are much more interested in Korea, Japan, India, um, or the UK. And um, a lot of that is because they feel that those countries are more, um, their cultures are more attractive. And it's interesting to me because when I was thinking about what China is doing in terms of its soft power, um, what we see is a lot of elite perceptions of China as a very useful regional actor. Um, a lot of uh, assumptions of China at the elite level as being very uh, important for the region, but at the public level, uh, very little understanding of China. Um, so it seems to me there's a question, uh, a gap between tools and targets. And I think that's interesting because typically when we talk about soft power, we talk about tools, whether it's pop culture, education, outreach, uh, media. Um, but I think target is equally important. Um, when you look at co countries like Korea, for example, or Japan or India that are very successful in their soft power outreach, um, their tools are, are kind of organically created and, and distributed. You know, people love Korean wave Hallyu stuff. They love Japanese anime and manga and Bollywood film. Um, the tools that are being used in the Middle East by China are mostly state-developed tools. Um, you know, the purpose of this, China is trying to use soft power into the region to uh, create or, or project Chinese um, narratives about China's development and China's presence. Uh, you hear Chinese officials talk, talk about countering media hegemony, which is always code for, you know, American um, bias about China's rise. Um, but the problem is when they're projecting their, their, their narratives into the, to the region, it's often quite ham-fisted, I would argue, uh, because again, th this is state-led cultural products. Um, the problem they have, I think, is that when you look at Chinese cultural products, 
uh, especially things that would be attractive for a younger audience. Uh, a lot of the most attractive stuff would be Hong Kong film or Taiwanese pop songs, things that the PRC um, isn't really a big fan of, you know, and the stuff that's being produced by the PRC is typically done by people that either have uh, concerns about, uh, you know, self-censorship or um, party, uh, you know, party censorship or people watching over what they're working on. So the, the stuff that's being sent into the region from PRC tends to be very politicized. You know, we see a lot of hip hop songs about Belt and Road Initiative or hip hop songs about Xi Jinping. And this stuff isn't really attractive uh, to the audience the same way, you know, that uh, BTS or a lot of other things are. So in terms of the tools, what we see is, you know, um, a lot of media outreach from, from PRC and you see a lot of educational outreach and certainly those tools are very effective. Um, you know, for example, here in the UAE, there's going to, the um, Chinese language has been introduced into the nat national curriculum. Uh, the same is happening in Saudi Arabia. You see a lot of uh, scholarships that have existed for, for Middle Eastern students to go to China and get advanced degrees. Um, but still at the same time, people don't really know China very well. And, and, and I think this is a, a pretty significant gap because again, what we see are a lot of stories about China's uh, inexorable rise in the region and, and, and what a powerful country it is, but at the same time, almost nobody really knows much about it. Um, so I think what you see is, is these state-led narratives about you know, China's development model or its economic model or, or you know, how China differs from the US. And this is very attractive at the state level, but it isn't really resonating with uh, the popular or the public level. So it's, it's kind of interesting to me to see this gap between uh, the efficacy of, of tools um, being used for, for uh, um, official targets versus popular targets, because at the popular level, it's just not very effective yet. Whereas at the, at the official level, it seems that China is being uh, quite effective in, in its messaging. Um, but still, that doesn't really translate into soft power outreach so much as it does, I guess, public diplomacy. Um, I would say that it's been more effective in public diplomacy, but in terms of soft power, it's been really quite ineffective. Um, that looks like six minutes and 40 seconds. So I'll stop here. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for keeping within the time uh, frame. And I think it's a very interesting counterpoise to what we had earlier in the afternoon in terms of the um, views in the South Asia part of the presentations. Let's move to the next speaker from one of my colleagues, um, Brafna David, who is at the both the Chinese Institute and the uh, politics department. And she is speaking on the subject of shifting societal responses to China's Belt and Road Initiative across Central Asia. Over to you, Rafna. Uh, Rafna, you are, you are muted. You have unmuted, but I can still not hear you. Let me see whether if I mute you and then unmute you, whether it works. Okay. I still can't hear you. Can others hear, hear uh, Brafna? Aki, are you able to help with this? I don't, I don't think we are hearing you, uh, Brafna. No, we're not hearing you. Uh, try to say something, Brafna. I, I don't No, we're not hearing you. Um, I think what we would do, uh, Brafna, is that I will ask Anouks to come in first and then I'll ask Akis to contact you directly to see whether we can work out the technical glitch there. If this is okay with you, um, Anush, if you are 
able to make the presentation now, and then I'll, we will come back to uh, Brahna. And Anush is, of course, Professor um, Atishami from the Department of Politics and International Relations at Durham University, speaking on the very important subject of built on power manifestations of China's presence in West Asia or the Middle East. Over to you, Anouk. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, first of all, for inviting me and also to the China Institute at SOAS and all your colleagues for hosting us so ably. It's been such a fascinating event and I've learned a great deal from my co-panelists this afternoon. So I'm delighted to be here. And it's, it's a hard act to follow Jonathan, I have to say as well, given the material that he's covered. So let me make three introductory comments and then I'll, I'll, I'll race through the rest. The first three introductory comments are the following. Built on power, but power for me has three uh, dimensions to it in this context. It's fuel, it's geopolitics, and it is soft. Um, secondly, you can, you can draw a direct line from China's four modernizations, which were launched in, in late 1970s, uh, to open up its economic uh, system to its deeper engagement with the MENA region today. And thirdly, China's future relations with the Middle East region accelerated following its real great leap forward, which was in 2001, when it joined the World Trade Organization that arguably transformed China's economy in terms of its development, in terms of its growth trajectory, but most importantly from this region's perspective in terms of its rapid industrialization. So that leads me to then start my presentation with, with, with the subtitle, for want of a better term, the 1993 moment. Why is that important? Because this marks the period of growing relations between China and West Asia which was being cemented on China becoming a net importer of oil for the first time. That was significant. Not only was it indicative of China's rapid development and industrialization, and that the rest of the world was dumping its industries on China, uh, but also that it was also likely to become more dependent on oil imports, particularly from this region. So China's double digit economic growth of the 1980s onwards, inevitably in my view, raised China's reliance on imported oil from the Middle East. Soon, China was the world's largest oil importer with between 40 and 50% of its oil coming from just nine Middle East countries. Think about it. And of those nine, four of them, Iran, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and to a lesser extent, switching between Qatar and Kuwait, these countries made up the bulk of China's oil imports from the region. So China was in effect dependent on a handful of countries in a very unstable region geopolitically. As a consequence, a new interdependency was emerging as oil exporters were also uh, needing the Chinese market for their main export, that is to say oil. Why is that? Largely because America became much more self-sufficient through its fracking industry that was taken off, and also that Europe, Japan, and South Korea were becoming stagnant oil importers. They were either using new technologies, um, renewable and so on, or because they'd taken so much of their industry to China, there wasn't the same need for oil imports from the Middle East. But the Middle East countries were still dependent on oil exports for their prosperity and indeed economic development. And as a consequence, they also became dependent on China continuing to consume the oil they produce. That was a classic example of an emerging interdependency, Steve. Energy exchange has paved the way for a flourishing trade and investment partnership between China and the MENA region. And also, of course, what this has led to is a growing presence of China, not just as an importer, but as an investor, as a trader on the ground, and as, as a cultural, emerging cultural icon with very new features for this region. The bulk of oil output of West Asia headed towards China, 
and oil import became one of the largest single items of, of, of China's overall import bill. That is really important because China was now having to use much of its, its export income to compensate for the oil that was coming from a handful of countries from the Middle East. There was an emerging circular motion here that was tying China's development to oil imports from this region and the need for it to continue to expand its economy to maintain the debt that oil income was generating. In terms of soft power, that is to say China's diplomatic presence as well as its economic presence, we can point to a number of features that have emerged in recent years. And these are very much what has created the conditions for deeper China Middle East engagement. The first point to make is that China is now a major trading partner of 10 Middle East states of different sizes and shapes. That is very important. Secondly, China is now the largest direct foreign investment, investor in the MENA region, investing in a whole host of projects in either as turnkey, but also as partner in local development projects. Thirdly, China has signed a series of bilateral partnership agreements with a large number of Middle East countries, including its, what it likes to brand and its comprehensive strategic partnership, partnership with three important Gulf states of Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. And it has done so at the height of geopolitical tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Fourth, China led uh, the establishment of what is known as the China Arab State Cooperation Forum in, 19, in 2004 to deepen its emerging relationship with the region. As far back as 2004, arguably, China was very conscious of the importance of this region to its future development. China, therefore, now has extensive links with Iran, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and 12 other Middle Eastern countries at the same time. What is important in that, of course, is that some of these countries, Iran and Saudi Arabia, Iran and Israel, Egypt and, and Iran, have actually got deep differences of their own. And yet China has been able to establish what are cordial, if not indeed warm relations with these countries at the same time. And China is busy investing and, con and developing their infrastructure, industry, and in major construction projects. The greatest of which, of course, is the building of New Cairo after 6,000 years of Egyptian civilization in, in Egypt. It's significant to me that China was selected as partner for that. And then, of course, Steve, there is the BRI, which is bringing a whole host of other interactions between the China and this region. But the big picture for me remains the following. That this has happened in less than one generation. The West built its domination of the region in about 150 years and dominated the region for virtually all of the 20th century. In 30 years, China has emerged as the largest trading partner of most of the economies of this region, as a larger investment, as the largest importer of its oil, but also with the greatest presence economically in this region. That leaves me with just one final comment, Steve, as time is running out with two. There are tensions as a consequence of this rapid transition at this, at this level between China and the West. Most importantly though, between America's perceptions of China's role in what was always seen as America's backyard. I'll stop there, thank you, Steve. Thank you very much, Anoush, for this very important uh, presentation which underlines how much we need to pay attention to the real successes of Chinese uh, engagement approach. Um, Bravna, are you back ready? Over to you. I hope that the technical issue has been resolved. I can see your PPT. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, and I can hear you as well. Okay, just, just please give me a second yes. because I have to use a different computer. Of course. Uh, I, 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 won't, I won't start the clock until you. Yeah, just. Uh, your. Um, 
slideshow. Just give me Play a couple more start. seconds, please. Don't worry. Excellent. Okay, here we go. So I will talk about the changes in the societal responses to Belt and Road Initiative across Central Asia, though my talk will focus primarily, primarily on Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. The launch of BRI in 2013 in Astana uh, raised uh, was was uh, was a uh, recognition to the geostrategic centrality of Kazakhstan and its importance as a transport corridor, and it also emphasized its economic potential. Particularly attractive then was the rhetoric of, sorry, uh, was the rhetoric of oneness, connectivity, complementarity, and win-win cooperation. So this was a new language for the region. President Nazarbayev was very quick to align. Uh, Kazakhstan's development, uh, development strategy, Nurlijol, with the Silk Road economic uh, belt, uh, as the BRI was known then. BRI also raised considerable hope and expectations in the region. So Kyrgyzstan saw that as an opportunity to establish connectivity and energy independence. For Uzbekistan, it was the chance to develop the ancient, uh, revive the ancient Silk Road and position itself at the center of trade, tourism, and transport connectivity. Tajikistan, we already heard this morning uh, uh, how Tajikistan also sought aid and legitimacy for the regime. And Turkmenistan, which did not sign BRI because it maintains its neutrality, but it happens to be the largest supplier of uh, gas uh, to China. So what about BRI? and its perception in the present context. We need to look at the various unanticipated events that, which have happened since, the fading potential of BRI, also number of questions that are being uh, raised and the lack of clarity about future. So China was seen as an alternative to Russia and to West also in a certain, uh, to a certain extent. But what we see is how the Sino, emerging Sino-Russian partnership has and condominium, uh, condominium has led to the weakening of Central Asian states and uh, the, the centrality of, of this Sino-Russian axis. There's also declining uh, Western role and influence. There is consolidation of authoritarian regimes in the region, which also emphasize, which also point to the fragility of these regimes and the uh, the lack of legitimacy of, of the regimes. We also see growing personal informal ties between Central Asian, uh, Asian ruling elites and the Chinese leadership. And finally, the uncertainty uh, caused by COVID and the future of connectivity and people-to-people -people ties. Here is an example of the goodwill that exists and that's cultivated between the ruling elite. So President Tokai, when he became the, uh, uh, when he assumed the leadership in Kazakhstan in 2019 and Sapar Japarov, uh, uh, who also uh, is the latest president of, of Kyrgyzstan being welcomed by Xi Jinping. Over the last two years, in particular, we have seen a wave of anti-China demonstrations, protests, and mobilization in both these countries. Kazakhstan, in particular, since 2019, has seen an activation of anti-China protests. The presidency of Tokayev, after Nazarbayev, resi uh, Nazarbayev resigned, has also provided an opening to uh, voices of reforms and democracy. There have been a number of issues on which the protests have taken place about the transfer of various 55 industries from China to Kazakhstan, on which there was a lot of misinformation, also concerns about the growing control of uh, China over energy resources, the issue of land lease to foreigners in which China is uh, particularly a sensitive issue, and, and finally the uh, sensitivity about Xinjiang. Kyrgyzstan has seen routinization of these protests uh, emerging uh, as seen by various conflicts in the bazaar in, in workplace. Then 2018, there was a scandal about the uh, $385 uh, million renovation of Bishkek power plant by a Chinese company. 
and the, the involvement of then president and prime minister and number of other government figures in the corruption scandal in which these people were, uh, were uh, found out to be lobbying for China and currently trials are going on. And more recently, the protests against a planned 375, three, uh, 275 million logistics center in Narin in North uh, Kyrgyzstan, very close to China. And there is also hysteria about Chinese migrants taking over. Just very quickly, you have the images about the protests in Kazakhstan in 2016 on the proposed uh, land lease law. The law was very complex, but it was perceived as something uh, enabling China to acquire control over Kazakhstan's lands. The opposition unified civil society activists used considerable uh, mobilizational skills and also disinformation to, uh, uh, to mobilize people. And finally, this put pressure on Nazarbayev to put moratorium on the law five-year moratorium on the law. Tokayev came to power and once again, he has extended the moratorium and there's no proper uh, debate on this, but there are many legal loopholes still, uh, still which allow China to gain access to uh, the land. Again, you have these images of protests in both Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. Particularly sensitive issue is Xinjiang and the persecution of of ethnic Kazakhs from, uh, uh, from China who have relocated to Kazakhstan. There are close skin connections between them. And over the last uh, few, three years, various protests have uh, broken out in which people are demanding uh, the release, information and the release of their kin from the so-called re-education camps and vocational centers. And the Kazakhstani government has been caught between domestic pressure, the demands to, uh, to protect dignity and well being of ethnic Kazakhs, and the friendship with China. Uh, here you see the protests of, and then the, uh, the decision to, uh, to uh, postpone the construction of this logistics center in Kyrgyzstan. So, what we see is that there are this strengthening of the elite bonds, but there is also at the same time considerable misgivings uh, within various strata of societies. So the ties between the elites, they are defined by tribute, patronage, also financial rewards, as well as ideological support to the uh, elites in power. At the same time, there are many intra-elite differences. So members of the government in both states privately express concerns about China's growing role. And at the same time, publicly, they pledge support and, and the, the proclaim solidarity. So if we try to define what are the pro-China and anti-China factions among the ruling elites in business in society, we find that they are consider considerably uh, closely entwined because on the one hand, there is also recognition that China currently presents the best hope and cooperation with China, business with China is inevitable. And at the same time, there are many, many concerns. Uh, so we find the same group of people, the same group of elites, uh, depending on the context and the issue articulating both pro and anti-China uh, positions. And Finally, again, is the inability of the regime to take any, to speak up on, on Xinjiang, which is, uh, which puts it in a very fragile and, and vulnerable position. So to conclude, finally, how do we look at these anti-China protests in, the, in these two countries? First and foremost, they reflect popular distrust among people of their own governments. They also reflect the anger at, a lack of credible information and accountability. And China has become a scapegoat for a broad set of grievances articulated by the people. We also find that in many ways, government and different groups in government tolerate these protests and also encourage them in order to put covert pressure on China. So what is really at heart here is also the ability of the government to manage these anti-China sentiments and popular opinion, and also the mismanagement, uh, despite the government's best efforts to control uh, and contain these opinions, that there, there uh, the situation remains out of its control, which has significant repercussions for the rhetoric about people-to-people -people tie and soft power of China and acceptance of China in the region. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Grafna. That's really fascinating and I think it's interesting that 
in the whole day's presentations until now, um, this is the first time that Uyghurs came up as a significant subject in the presentations, uh, even though quite a few countries that are strongly or regions that have strong Islamic presence have been covered uh, before you. I think we reached the point that we will have our second poll in this afternoon. So um, Aki, if you could put the polls up and then we will have a quick poll before we have the final two presentations. Please do uh, participants join in with the poll. Okay, we have 64% responses by now, um, but we did get a bit over 70%. So some of you obviously are still making up your mind. Let me just encourage you a bit to put your thoughts to the uh, questions.
it looks like we are stabilizing at 64% at participation. So I'll close the poll now with our five minutes. And what we have, we suggest that about 2% agree that Chinese power is very positive, 30% on balance positive, 38% on balance not positive, 10% not positive and 18% too complex to be uh, categorized with focusing on Central um, Asia and the Middle East. In terms of the soft power side, 2% very positive, 22% on balance positive, 36% on balance negative, 18% negative, and 22% um, too complex to categorize. So the um, too complex to, com to categorize number has fallen down quite a bit for this post compared to the, all previous ones, in fact. Um, we will park that for the moment, and then we'll come back to see what the overall picture is for all uh, in due course. In the meantime, let's move on. Um, and our next speaker is Muhuddin Sengwurgui from the University of Dar es Salaam, speaking on, I think, a really important subject, which is Afro-Chinese cultural exchanges, a one-way traffic question mark. I think obviously the punctuation there is critical. Over to you, to you, um, Muhuddin. Muhuddin, I'm not he not hearing yes. you. Hello, can you hear me now? I can hear you, but we can we can't see you. If you could put your you, camera, you can't, if you if if you don't mind, I won't turn on my video because there's a blackout here. So. Okay, in, in which case, please do just uh, go ahead and then um, you won't be able to see. Don't, don't worry, we, we are as so as we do understand that in different parts of the world, there are times when uh, connections and power yeah. supplies can be problematic. So please just go ahead and when yes. you start, I will start the clock. Uh, if you right. move, move to start of the slideshow. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about uh, Afro-Chinese cultural exchange and whether question whether it's a one-way traffic uh, culture because uh, culture has been a very important element in the China-Africa cooperation and have seen increasingly in recent years uh, that the uh, cultural exchanges have really, really taken center stage uh, in the relationship. But I want to start with by this quotation from Ogunsano Alaba, who in the 70s, he said, on the whole Chinese policy in Africa has resulted from the diplomatic initiative of the People's Republic of China rather than of the African states themselves. So this is, uh, I think it depicts uh, an assertive China, which is uh, sort of like defining the relationship between uh, China and Africa. Uh, and this is uh, just uh, an impression of what China is doing in Africa is from a recent white paper uh, uh, by the Chinese government. It cuts across many sectors, uh, security, medical uh, cooperation, party-to-party -party relations, uh, health sector as well. Uh, and because we're talking about culture, I think it's important to understand Chinese soft power. And because for China, soft power is anything except the use of military force, but centered around the idea of culture. Of course, we have other soft power resources, uh, foreign policy, political values, and aid, but everything is, is centered around promotion of Chinese culture. Uh, and talking about promotion of Chinese culture, you have uh, uh, internally, it's expected to bring about like internal cohesion, uh, where outside is about promotion and spreading Chinese uh, culture outside China, and in this context, uh, to Africa and African countries. Uh, uh, and then uh, <clears throat> uh, here, I'm uh, just trying to connect the, the Belt and Road Initiative and culture, uh, because there's certain elements of culture in the Belt and Road Initiative. <clears throat> As you can see on, this, on the screen here, uh, uh, these are just some of the initiatives that I also have uh, an, uh, 
a link to, to with uh, the, the, this Belt and Road Initiative. But if you're looking at the presence of Af Chinese culture in Africa, you have to start with the Confucius Institutes. And now uh, you have 59 Confucius Institutes in Africa in, in 44 African countries and 41 uh, Confucius uh, classrooms. Uh, this is significant. Uh, but you might also observe that uh, the learning of Chinese language in Africa is also moving beyond the, the Confucius Institutes. And now you have some governments integrating Mandarin in their school curricula, like in Tanzania. There have been efforts in Uganda as well, Kenya, and, and, and South Africa. So it's not just for Confucius Institutes, now it's going beyond uh, the Confucius Institutes. And of course, cultural festival, the Chinese New Year celebration, this was something unknown to many Africans many few years ago, but now, it's a very colorful annual event. Uh, this one was in, uh, in Tanzania, in the picture. Uh, it became a very important event in the national calendars of, of many, uh, many African countries. And there's a growing appetite for Chinese martial arts, especially among young people as well. Uh, for example, the annual Wushu tournament. Uh, this is usually done in uh, an annual event in many African countries, but sometimes it's organized regionally, like in the East African community where they have a regional tournament for the Wushu, uh, Chinese uh, uh, martial arts. And here I was trying to link to like the, uh, aid, China aid in education and cultural promotion. So here the University of Dar es Salaam library built by China. Uh, and then just sitting next to it is the Confucius Institute. Uh, the one you see I've cycled in red. Uh, so you see education and culture going uh, together. <clears throat> I look at African students in China as vehicles of promotion of Chinese culture because when they come back uh, in their respective countries, they come with certain Chinese values and therefore I think they're playing a very uh, important role in the promotion and spreading of, uh, of Chinese culture uh, in Africa. And the number has been growing over the years. Uh, and then also you have uh, Chinese TV soaps which have been dubbed in African language such as Kiswahili and, and Hausa. And Star Times has played a very important role in this regard. This is a Chinese company that provides uh, digital uh, satellite uh, television services and has made significant inroads into, into Africa. Also, there are some cultural presence, African cultural presence inside China. Uh, this is a primary school in Zhejiang province. Uh, they have a special program focusing on uh, African cultures. Uh, it's impressive to see these uh, kids being uh, introduced some elements of, of African culture at a very young age. I've been there myself and I look very impressive. Uh, and some African language also have managed to find spaces in Chinese high, high learning institutions like Beijing University. They provide courses in Kiswahili and Hausa as well as China International uh, Studies the University where they offer a degree in, 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 in Swahili language. I think this is a very uh, significant uh, development in the exchange. Uh, and this is uh, at the Shanghai Natural History Museum where they have a section for Tinga Tinga painting. And Tinga Tinga painting is a famous painting uh, from East Africa, particularly from Tanzania. And it has found its way in the Chinese museum, uh, in this case, in Shanghai. But also we have African Afri uh, artifacts in many museums across China. Now you look at the exchange, it's kind of skewed where you look at China, uh, as, as an initiator, as the founder, and it has certain leverage on the narrative on the exchange and Africa sometimes being the initiator, but less on, on the narrative and less funding and sometimes no funding at all. And I think puts Africa at a disadvantage. Uh, uh, and then there have been also cultural misunderstandings like uh, the blackface incidents, which are uh, uh, cause the angry reactions from the global African community. And this is something that we need to take into consideration because Africans, not just on the continent, we also talk about the African diaspora and their experiences in their race relations can be very uh, different interpretation from those in the continent as well. Uh, I, uh, the, the, the Black Civilization Museum in Dhaka, Senegal, which was built by China, uh, I think is an example for an African country has its own cultural ambition, cultural aspiration, and then China comes with the funding and then kind of complements the local ambition, cultural ambition, in this case of Senegal. And therefore Senegal, this is kind of like win-win situation. 
uh, the Mandela Institute was an idea by Adam Godomo uh, to the South African government, like to establish a, as Mandela Institute as an answer to the Confucius Institute. Of course, it hasn't happened, but it was the idea was to uh, urge African countries to step up their agency and uh, be on equal footing uh, with uh, with China uh, in the in the in these uh, in these exchanges. So I'll stop there, and uh, if there's more, then we'll probably later in the discussion. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Muhuddin. That it was really interesting and important to, to get the perspectives of how the Chinese efforts to project soft power is going down quite positively in different parts of Africa. Let's now move on and swing to the other side of the world. Uh, we fun loaded most of the East Asian panels at the uh, morning session because of the time difference with speakers from that part of the world. But this is a speaker who is with a colleague at SOAS, um, Chrysidas uh, Kirsch, who is an excellent scholar on Japanese um, culture and literature, who will be speaking on the subject of waking up the neighbor, visualizing China's economic rise in Japanese fictional media. Over to you, Christos. Thank you, Steve. Um, and I'm sharing the screen now. Sure. So, um, right. So, um, I'm at SOAS. Uh, um, it's a great pleasure for me to be presenting at home, so to speak. I'm in the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures, and I actually teach cinema, not literature. So <laughs> screen studies, sorry. So you will see lots of visuals and not to popular culture. So I am not a political scientist. So my presentation and its style and content is very different. So um, please bear with me. The research I'm presenting today has been published already respectively, um, is be in the process of being published. So um, I will particularly cover how Japan looks at China. And um, there is a slight side nod to um, the inspiration for the title, because it is very much about um, how Japan was sleeping through China's rice, as I would um, perhaps like to postulate here. In um, if we need if we look at oops excuse me um, if you look at uh, Chinese domestic uh, cross domestic product um, um, and I have started the research basically the comparison when China reappeared in Japan's post war imagination in 1989 you can see that there is an, um, until 2005 and then there was a long period of non representation. So you can see it is a linear graph upwards, more or less, um, in a very clear upward trajectory. Uh, 1989 marks the time when the rise and the years beyond between 2005 and 1989 um, becomes the first time um, very visible in how um, China is actually getting um, is actually getting a more prominent on the world stage and sort of viewed from Japan, the other economic giant in East Asia, um, it was sometimes seen with distrust and sometimes seen not so. At the same time, um, the Chinese, uh, sorry, the Japanese um, gross domestic product went on the roller coaster. Um, it, it has been called a stagflation. So mirroring approximately the same time, you can see the first dent in the up to then pretty rapid economic growth and it started growing again and went back down and so on. So um, two very different trajectories. But that's not all. At the same time, we have a lot of controversy between Japan and China uh, emerging also in that material, particular period of time, one of them being Yaskuni Shrine, where 14 class A war criminals are enshrined as martyrs. And whenever somebody visits, um, it becomes a massive diplomatic issue. Another one being the um, disputed islands um, uh, somewhere um, west of uh, uh, Naha in Okinawa and east of China, so with unclear ownership um, it, between Japan, China, and Taiwan. All of these um, events and controversies go back to the time of Japanese imperialism, um, when Japan tried to expand its empire 
um, throughout East Asia. In many ways, this meant just exchanging the colonial master from um, a usually British, French one to a Japanese one. At that time, you could get an awful lot of representation of um, Japanese, uh, uh, Sino-Japanese relations, um, particularly in around Manchuria, with the exemplar being um, Lee Koran's films um, here, for example, Shina no Yoru, in which China was always feminine, female, and in need to be dominated from um, Japan. Um, this is not a broken slide. After the end of the war, um, there was nothing. There was no representation for a long period of time because China and Japan were divided by the Cold War and there was absolutely no engagement and therefore no interest and barely any Chinese characters appearing anywhere. They started reappearing, as I already mentioned, in 1989, and they followed very clear representation patterns, um, and they were always in the same kind of ways. This is, ex is, is the first film um, taken Nosuka, the Beijing watermelon, um, that was released in 1989 and showed Chinese students in need of Japanese aid. But with students coming into the country, you also get um, the issue around foreign criminality. So we move very quickly from Chinese students to the Chinese mafia um, that are um, trying illegal dealings in Japan and um, uh, in, in many ways uh, being problematic or seen as problematic as the Gaijin Hanzai Ura Failu shows. Um, this was a magazine that was published in 2007, and that very clearly gives, as you can see here, China the um, uh, award as being the most dangerous nation for Japanese internal security. At the same time, however, there was almost like a counter trend for Japanese businessmen to go to China and therefore find healing very symbolically in the bird people in China, giving the flailing at that time Japanese economy wings to fly again and to be rediscovered in China. And at the same time, but very late, uh, but later on, you had um, Chinese stars come appearing on Japanese television here, Fei Wong falling in love with a Japanese character and having a happy, happy ending, which is very unusual when it came to um, love stories between um, Chinese and Japanese characters. And then again, from there onwards, we go into non-representation. The controversies around Yasukuni Shrine and Senkaku had triggered so many anti-Japanese protests that the fictional dream worlds were no longer um, adequate to represent. And um, for a long time, China again disappeared off the screens only for it to re-emerge this time in 2012 as a, a military threat in the film Final Judgment. It is never mentioned that the country that is actually attacking and invading Japan is actually China, but it is very clear in terms of language and um, uniforms that this is what they are alluding to. Um, but at the same time, going again back to the empire, you can see a certain nostalgic gaze towards what happened in Manchuria emerging, like a time of Sino-Japanese friendship that was not troubled by all of the controversies, um, particularly on, on television in and around 2015. The most recent um, example of China appearing on uh, Japanese television is actually also broadcast to us, and that is Japan Sinks, People of Hope, in which Japan very much stands there begging for immigrants to be allowed to enter. Japan, uh, China, so uh, as the Chinese, uh, sorry, the Japanese archipelago is sinking. So it's this very rough ride. You can see that the relationship in terms of media representation was always unbalanced. Um, and Beta Greece has put this in a very nice sentence. They tended to view that bilateral relationship, whether past, present or future, predominantly in hierarchical terms, with the only question being who was superior when. So um, these worlds, however, also permitted Japanese audiences to kind of not quite see how China was rising because it was constantly represented as inferior and never on the same terms and never at high level. Therefore, when um, controversies emerge, they are always at the um, I'm very surprised that these are there. What might the future bring? Um, I guess we're going to have to see. Um, Japan Sinks is still running. It's not yet concluded um, to what extent China will get a bigger part or not remains to be seen. 
And um, with that, I think that's six minutes, 40 seconds. So thank you, Steve. Well, and thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Chrysalis. I think it's absolutely amazing to see how China uh, is presented in the uh, Japanese films. Um, I think the use of the blank screen was really a very nice touch there. With that, let's have our last poll and then we will have all the aggregate of the post uh, before we before I wind up. Please, um, if we could try to do the polls as quickly as we can, then we will have a bit more time to take stock of all the posts before we finished at half past three. We have 62% participation so far. I think we average a bit over 70%. So I will encourage you to put your um, responses in as quickly as you feel comfortable. Sixty-five, still. It looks like we have stabilized at 69 for a bit now. So I will draw it to a clo <clears throat> close. And then in the meantime, Aki will try to add all the polls together so that we have a poll of polls result 
in a minute. Um, what we have for this particular part of the session is that we're about 4% saying that uh, China's use of power is very positive, 30% on balance positive, 37% um, on balance not so positive, but only 11% negative, clearly negative, and 17% a bit difficult to categorize. For the soft power bit, 2% clearly positive, 24% on balance positive, 39% on balance not so positive, 24% not positive and 11%, only 11% too uh, complex to categorize at this stage. So Aki, if you could share with us the uh, overall result from the whole days of polling, I think we will probably have some interesting uh, results that we can see. Yes, thank you. Now, what we have here is that on average, we have 70% of people uh, responding and three point six six percent less than 4% would see China as using its power as very positive, 34.5% generally positive, so makes it about uh, forty percent on the positive side. On the negative side, we are looking at about twenty-three over twenty-three percent on balance, not negative. Uh, just less than twelve percent, clearly not positive, therefore negative, and 26, 27 percent too complex to categorize. So we, on average, actually see China's use of power, both in terms of its hard power and soft power as being more positive than as being negative. I think that is something which I think uh, is interesting, particularly in the wider context of the deteriorating relationship between China and the United States and how much the image of China has turned negative in um, rich capitalist democratic Western countries in Europe and North America, including Australia and New Zealand as a whole, but in the parts of the world where SOAS focus our studies, where there are many regular day-to-day uh, -day contacts with China, whether the Chinese focus quite a lot of their BRI projects and engagement, positive active engagement, they are actually getting more positive responses than they are getting negative responses. It sometimes almost doesn't matter whether we, we understand soft power in the way that Joe Nye has defined it as something which simply uh, is there and make people and get people to admire you or the Chinese approach to soft power, which is that they proactively go out to project that soft power and sometimes mixing a fair bit of what in uh, Western scholarship we now call sharp power with soft power, but they are actually getting a good run of their approach in important parts of the world. Well, obviously, if they are the parts of the world that SOAS studies by definition, they are very important parts of the world. Um, what I think also, come across to me as very interesting for the whole day is that the morning session and the afternoon sessions don't really completely go in complete parallel. I think if you have missed the morning sessions, I would encourage you to see whether you can find time to go on our website and find the recording for the morning session. Likewise, I, the people who attended the morning session but not able to attend the afternoon session, I think there's a lot to be said about uh, attending, watching uh, the recording to give us a much rounder sense of how um, the, the world from East Asia, Japan on the East, all the way to the West Coast of Africa, look at China and interact with China. And I would like to now draw this conference to a close and thank all of you, um, all the speakers who have kindly shared it their thoughts with us and their insight, 
some joining us at very inconvenient time from many different parts of the world and for support from co colleagues at SOAS, both academic and administrative, and also to thank all of you who are participants, particularly for sharing your thoughts with us in the polling. I hope that this is the beginning. It has shown to us how valuable it is to engage in this kind of conversations with colleagues across the world. And I hope that when the pandemic is over, there will be opportunities when we can bring uh, some of you at least to show us to have extended conversations and a lot more time for actual debate, engaging on the specific insights that you have so kindly share with us. Well, thank you very much and goodbye from me.